When you returned post the war and entered university, were there lecturers at the time that you recall fondly? Well, I certainly um, recall uh, J.D. Holmes, who was a lecturer in constitutional law. Uh, he had a considerable impact or influence on me. Uh, and also um, Professor Morrison, who lectured in torts, um, they were two influential lecturers. Um, they made the subjects very interesting. And uh, also, I think, Professor Stone. Um, Professor Stone was, to some extent, a difficult personality. But, um, and one, uh, I was inclined to resist part of the Julia Stone message. But in fact, later on, it did have a significant influence on me. And that message was? Uh, that message really was that um, you needed to look beyond the precedence. You look, needed to look really at the policy of the law. Um, and he was uh, an exponent of the view that a lot of legal judicial reasoning uh, could be ascribed to categories of meaningless reference. Was he unusual in his day for that kind of thinking? Uh, he was unusual by Australian standards, but not by American standards. Was he much influenced by what was going on in America? I, yeah, I, I'm, he, I'm very interested to know more about him, actually, because quite a number of people have alluded to him as yeah. being an important formative figure in their own yes. well, st I think experience of the law. He, you could describe him as um, a disciple of realist jurisprudence, uh, and he had spent a good deal of time in the United States uh, as an academic, and uh, I think he was uh, himself much influenced by Pound, by Roscoe Pound, who undoubtedly was one of the greatest jurists in the English-speaking world. Back here in Australia, did you know whether he argued much with his fellow academics oh, yes. about this approach? It, it was well known that he and Professor Williams, the New Zealand academic who became uh, a very well-known contract lecturer, um, had ongoing disagreements that couldn't be resolved. And in addition, uh, as I understand it, he had difficulties with uh, other academics at the Faculty of Law in Sydney. Um, I don't think you could describe Julia Stone as a popular person. Of course, though, sometimes to make change, you can't really necessarily no, exactly. be popular. Exactly. Mm. And we've, we've come to see that over the years, certainly in politics, but particularly with re relevance to Mabo, which we'll come back to a little bit later on. Some interesting comments made by Paul Keating, who was the Prime Minister at that time. Mm. But we'll return to that in a moment. So during your studies at, at university, were you beginning to form a fairly strong idea of the areas you'd like to specialise in, or were you instead looking to having a general practice once you uh, came to the bar? Uh, I think my, my main intention at the time was, uh, when I was a student, um, was to follow in the footsteps of my uncle, who essentially was uh, an equity lawyer, uh, but also did constitutional law. Um, but then later on, uh, I thought it was desirable, if possible, to develop more, a more general practice. Equity law, of course, was not an area that too many people could aspire to in those days, and there was a bit of a, a kind of schism, I understand, in those days at the bar between those who went into criminal practice and those who specialised in equity. Equity was seen as the clean hands jurisdiction. Uh, yes, but of course you need to bear in mind that in Sydney, it was different from Melbourne because in Melbourne you had a judicature act system, and had that Melbourne had had that system, Victoria had had that system for a long time, but um, it wasn't until um, 1975 that a judicature act system was introduced in New South Wales. So you had a distinct division of jurisdictions: common law on the one hand, and equity on the other. I'm looking at a lovely photograph here. Uh, well, it features on the cover of a Justinian magazine published in 1995, and it's called here Admission Day 1951, and it's a picture of you and your wife. You weren't long married at that time. No, that's right. 
And uh, I'm afraid there's a couple of rather irreverent bubbles that are being ascribed to you and your wife. But uh, you were telling me before the interview that when that photograph was taken, there were newspaper men hanging around, and otherwise there may not have been any photograph of you at all. I think that's right, yes. Because bar rules in those days forbade people to be yes. photographed. yes. So I'm very glad, and we, I think we all are, that there was a, a photographer present on that day. Your day of admission... I don't think actually gained me any work at all. <laughs> I think prospective clients, if they saw it, would think that barrister seems too attached to that female <laughs> to concentrate on my problems. But you could always have said, well, I was newly married. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so who moved your admission? Uh, my recollection is that uh, Ken Asprey, the barrister with whom I read, moved my admission. I've heard some interesting stories about Ken Asprey as, a, as an advocate. Was his colourful and uh, strongly, as one person put it, salesman style of advocacy influential for you? Uh, not really, no. Uh, I wouldn't describe him uh, as a salesman or his advocacy as sales, salesman type. It was forceful advocacy, um, and it certainly had a rhetorical flourish to it, because he was a born actor. Actors are persuaders, though, aren't they? Well, they are, yes, and um, advocacy is the art of persuasion. But you never felt he stooped to that kind of, if you like, technique? Well, he was prepared to stoop to various things, but I don't think he actually stooped to being... A salesman, I suppose a client might have regarded him as a good salesman, but I didn't see him in that light. So in what ways was he influential for you? Uh, he was particularly influential in making it clear that, by and large, the practice of the law as a barrister needs meticulous attention to facts and evidence, and that in turn needs... Uh, a close knowledge of the principles of evidence. You were mentioning earlier uh, Julius Stone's approach to uh, jurisprudence, which you said at the time wasn't influential but became influential for you later. I suppose in those early days at the bar you were mostly concerned with mastering all the facts and being on top of the facts as opposed to looking for greater degrees of interpretation. Yes, but th there's something more to it than that. Now... Um, See, the law school was then situated in Phillips Street in Sydney. It wasn't on the university campus. Uh, quite a number of the lecturers, um, the, most of the lecturers, would have been legal practitioners. They weren't academic lawyers. There were few academic lawyers who actually taught. Uh, Professor Morrison was an example, as indeed was Professor Stone himself. Therefore, the emphasis in the law school in those days was on the practice of the law. Very few optional subjects. Um, you were educating lawyers to become members of the practising profession. And that's the reason why I tended to regard Professor Stone as an ivory-towered academic whose views on the law, while interesting, probably didn't have uh, much of a connection with the law as it was practised in the profession and in the courts. It's interesting you say that. A few that I've interviewed did say that they have better memories of those who were practitioners than those like yes. you who were considered you know, purely academic and they're the ones they recall as being most useful for their own practice later on. Mm. It's interesting too, I'm just looking, this photo of you on your admission day in 1951, Chester Porter was admitted only a few years before you, but never read with anyone. And he said it wasn't uncommon in those days not to necessarily read with people. Did you know um, about that? Were you expecting when you came to the bar to read yes, with did. someone? But, but again, you see, uh, I'd been brought up in a legal tradition largely through the influence of my uncle, uh, who regarded this as absolutely essential. So it never occurred to me that you wouldn't be reading with somebody, and so I read with Asprey and with Els Mitchell. Chester said he was probably not likely to get to read with anyone in those days because he was considered a bit of a smart aleck. Well, uh, Chester and I must share this quality in common. Um, well, that's true. Uh, actually, Chester was also a denizen uh, 
of the basement floor in Denman Chambers. And I remember him in those days. He'd, he'd been admitted to the bar, I'd say, probably two years earlier than I had. Um, uh, and he was a well-known debater in university circles. Mm. Were you fond of debating yourself? I did, I, I did debating. I wasn't particularly fond of debating, that I used to debate at school, and I did debate for a his, his, He was more commercial equity practitioner, whereas uh, Asprey had a general practice. Some equity work, a good deal of commercial work, common law work of various kinds, including later on personal injury work as well. Um, and it was through uh, the contacts that they had with solicitors that uh, I managed to get work by dint of their assistance and recommendations. See, I used to appear in court with them as an unpaid junior to begin with, um, and then I'd get to know the solicitors who were instructing them. But, of course, with Clayton Utes, I knew Clayton Utes anyhow, and uh, they used to brief both, both counsel. Who was your clerk in those days? Jack Craig was uh, the clerk to the floor on which Asprey was the counsel, um, and uh, he also gave me a bit of assistance as well. What was he like? Oh, Jack was a fairly brusque sort of character, um, rather down-to-earth fellow. And I, I remember my uncle said to me when I was a law student, you ought to go over to the Supreme Court and hear some of these counsel um, presenting cases and arguing cases. And he said to Jack, you know, take uh, young Tony over there and make sure that the counsel is listening to a good. And then they took, he took, I remember him taking me over to hear one particular counsel. And when I reported back to my uncle, my uncle said to me, he's no good at all. He's wasting his time taking you over there. A judgment, I must say, I formed about the council myself. That's interesting, because I interviewed a long-serving clerk recently who said that um, one of his uh, techniques was to send out very junior barristers to go and check out some of these council appearing in court and then report back about what they were like. And uh, so I was interested about that. So were you actually being used as a kind of sounding board, as no, it were? No, not really, no. But all the same, he went and had a look at these uh, people yes. at his instigation. Mm. I was being told also about another, uh, a pair of Clark's brothers, the Marx brothers. Did you have much to do with them? No, I didn't have much to do with them, but I knew them. Mm. Mm. Michael McHugh talked a bit about them when yeah. I interviewed him, and uh, yeah. they were known as, I think, the 10 percenters or the 5 percenters. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Which wasn't always well regarded by the profession at the time. No. Mm. But as far as you were concerned, you were well looked after as far as the clerking side of things was concerned? Mm. Mm. Yes. But when I went on to um, the seventh floor in Wentworth Chambers, Fred de Sachs was my clerk, and he was a well-known clerk and a very easy person to get on with. Some of them weren't, I gather. Yes, that's right. Did that mean that people had to work harder to get briefs as a result? Uh, probably. It, it rather depended on the practice of the individual barrister. Um, uh, the work I got generally came directly from solicitors. They didn't go through the clerk. Uh, clerks exercised more influence in relation to common law work where there was more of a tradition of handing briefs on. If X wasn't available, then the clerk would provide Y to do the case. Um, the work I did didn't lend itself to that practice nearly as much. 